Hello folks, Jason Chrisman, JC's Bees, your Central Ohio beekeeper. I want to show you what bees look like when they're cold. Check this out. Okay, so I'm out here waiting for the sun to come up and warm everything up a little bit so I can go do my farm chores. But uh, what I'm doing is I'm going around and reducing the colonies um, that have boxes that didn't have anything stored in it. So for instance, this is a five over a five. There's the five. There's the, well, I guess it was four over five. So it was a double nuke. I just broke it down. They didn't put any resources at all in the top box. The bottom box is crammed full. When I open it up, you know, this is the first thing I see in which you see motionless bees, right? Well, that's because it's 28 degrees. But if you look real close, there is a few moving. This is, this is how it is in the winter, folks. Bees greatly slow down their metabolism. Actually, if it would stay cold, 26 degrees or so, for a period of, I don't know, three or four, maybe five days, the bees would enter what they call torpor, in which they do look completely lifeless until you warm them up. I have a video that shows how I took a bee years ago in this frozen torpor state where they're, they look lifeless and I took it in the house and it warmed up and you can see how after the bee warms up it starts to move around a little bit but I just wanted to show you real quick and give you an idea what it looks like when bees go into winter now everybody thinks when they create heat they're heating this whole environment and that's not the case they don't heat the hive like we heat our homes the only thing that's warm is this area right here where the cluster is. And you can see how the cluster is between one, two, three, four frames. So anyway, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and throw on my spacer for dry sugar when I need to feed it. Some fondant or whatever I need to put in there. I'm gonna put my inner cover back on, just like so. Well, I'm gonna clean them ants off. Looks like the ants froze. All right, we've got that back on. Now what I'll probably end up doing, I know I will, um, I'll switch out this inner cover for a piece of um, foam insulation about three quarters of an inch thick. So now, put the lid back on. And I'll move to the next colony. So, you're probably thinking, why is he showing me this? Well, I'm going to tell you why I'm showing you this. I've seen many, many beekeepers throughout the years of my time in beekeeping. Um, over winter, they make a quick inspection. They see bees in this lifeless stage and they think, well, starting over. All my bees died. And they dump them out on the ground. Only to find out when it warms up that the bees weren't dead. They were just in a state of torpor or their metabolism was greatly slowed down and they weren't showing much movement. So keep that in mind this winter. Don't think, hey, I peeked in my hives. My bees weren't moving. Looks like I'm starting over because that isn't the case. Wait for a warm day to peek in on your bees and see how they're doing. Um, now, in this video, I will be working the bees first thing in the morning um, without my veil, without a smoker, um, just because of the cold temperatures. And it made things quite easy, but if you decide to do this, um, let me tell you something. Don't be removing frames. Just remove the boxes that, that you need to move. Um, don't be breaking frames apart. In this cold weather, not only is honeycomb very brittle and will just shatter to pieces, but the bee glue that the bees have between the frames is like concrete right now. And it takes a lot more effort to get things broke apart to pull out a frame. So please, don't be pulling out frames when it's cold. So some time has passed. The sun's come up over the trees. It's now blasting out here in the bee yard, at least on different parts of it. Um, farm chores are done. I've had my lunch belly's full things are looking up for the day except for here in the bee yard there's some discouraging news this morning 
you see a lot of these hives that were doubles are now singles with the exception of this one here um, yeah, I went through them first thing this morning um, you know I find that it's real easy to work the bees when they're in that cluster don't even really need to wear protection or even have your smoker but anyway um, a lot of these boxes they didn't for some reason I guess the colder temperatures they didn't take the last round of uh, SERP and their feeders and uh, they're looking a lot lighter than I liked so I removed all the top boxes um, all of the bottom boxes are loaded with food but the top boxes got a stack of them here to store so you know you get a lot of new beekeepers they're wondering what do you do with all of your drawn comb how do you store that this isn't the greatest example it's got a big burger right here that needs to be drawn out but there is some decent comb in here that I want to protect like that right there and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and I'm going to stack them out here in the bee yard it's getting to the point now um, wax moths aren't going to survive out in the cold elements they're going to need to be in a colony with some bees to survive so what I've got is I've got a solid bottom board and I've got one already underneath uh, this medium box this actually has some really nice comb in it if I, you know, I can't get it apart without my hive tool but I'm going to stack them these boxes right on these bottom boards just like so they're actually top covers but they'll work as bottom boards and I'm going to stack all of these colonies right here and once I get them all stacked here I'm going to push them tight together so they help support each other so that is my plan for these now these have uh, frame feeders in them which I have emptied since this morning I uh, probably are going to leave those in there for right now just worried about getting them uh, stacked and put away for the season Now, what you do want to make sure is that there's no openings. This here, I want to pull this out, and I'm going to want to plug this up. This down here, I can turn. It's glued in that position right this second. There, now that one's closed. So I need to plug this off. That will greatly uh, reduce anything getting in there and messing with your comb. If you don't have anything to plug that off, staple some uh, rabbit wire or something over it. So at the very least, mice aren't getting in there. So you can see another one here, it's got a tubed entrance. So I'll remove that. This one's still got the beetle barn on it. I've got a stack of them going on down here. So we're just uh, getting ready for the cold weather, folks. It's a coming. Well, it's already here, really. Last week, uh, it's been rather frigid in the morning and only getting into about the mid 40s in the daytime. So, not the greatest for the bees right now. Yep, I emptied that one too. So, we'll just keep stacking them up. This colony down there where I'm stacking them, I'll show you. They weren't uh, exactly happy when I opened them this morning. Both of these boxes are loaded with bees, top and the bottom. So, as my mouse guard, that's what I like about these metal entrance wheels. You just turn it. Use the excluder as your mouse guard. Wham, bam, you're done. So, I should probably do the same with the top. But since I don't have my veil on or my smoker, I'll probably wait till morning to do that. So up on top, I've already got uh, my shim where I can add dry sugar or fondant. I've got a, uh, an entrance 
here at the top for them to go in and out and also a place for moisture to wick in and out there's a bee actually right there up here I've got an inner cover with an entrance so they've actually got a couple it's got a double top entrance colony that's what it is it's a double top entrance no I just by chance happen to have an inner cover that has an entrance right there but that inner cover will be getting swapped out with a piece of uh, foam insulation even though I do have a polystyrene lid right there I'll still probably put the foam insulation under it so over here we got another hole to plug off here I'm collecting my uh, beetle barns so I can take and store them for the winter sure glue them in there don't they You know, just because I don't think it's safe to go any taller than that in the winter with our winds, I'm going to lay this inner cover down here and start another row. So there we go. So I've got a lot of resources here if you think about it I mean it looks like oh boy that's horrible all of them boxes you had to take off well it is kind of bad for the bees that they ain't gonna have that extra food storage I'm gonna to have to supplement more but on a positive note look at all this drawn resources I have come spring for splits that over here and I think that is it so I'll stack this up here to level things off provide a lid for everything and call it done these are some real simple metal lids um, I believe I got these from Sarah cell they sent them to me it's just a piece of metal and it's cut and the metals broke um, pretty simple really this fits right over the colony just like so all right so I'm gonna get some lids and close those two up pick up my beetle barns and uh, see what other things I've got to get into here so here's a piece of that foam that I'll stick on top of each nuke you can see where it was on the colonies last winter see where the frame they glued it to the frame drawed a little bit of burr comb between the space of the frame and the lid here um, one thing I do want to point out about this foam is during the winter it's alright to use this and the bees won't chew at it because they're not as active but come early spring um, when it starts to warm up a little bit and they start to move around more freely they are going to start chewing diblets and possibly holes and in, uh, in the foam now one way you can prevent the bees from chewing at it see there it's actually chewed down quite a bit um, they make a furnace tape it's aluminum looks like aluminum foil but it's tape if you cover this whole surface with that aluminum uh, taping or, or the aluminum foil and uh, then the bees don't react the same because obviously they can't chew aluminum but this foam they do like to chew at it when they are active but like I said in the winter and the fall it's a great uh, great tool to have for the bees they really appreciate when you stick this on their colony I do want to point out there is some things that you can put in boxes with drawn comb there's a product called Paramoth, which I will link down in the video description, that is safe to put in honey supers and uh, brood boxes with frames of comb. What you do not want to do, folks, and I cannot stress this enough, do not, and I mean do not, add, 
add wax moth, add moth balls to your honey supers or brood boxes with comb. There's some very dangerous chemicals in there and most people don't realize it, but beeswax is absorbable and it will absorb anything that you stick in there. So if you add moth balls um, to your stored uh, frames or comb, then your frames and comb are going to absorb that. And then next year when you extract honey to harvest, you'll be eating that. And not, not just you, but your customers and your friends and family. And that is not a good way to go about this. So start off the bat, completely avoid moth balls. What you want is paramoth. It's completely safe for your comb, for the bees, and for us. Okay, so, so, much like honeybees need to store So, much like honeybees, just like honeybees store their, just like honeybees need food stores during the winter, I need to build my heat stores for the winter. Uh, let's see, about eight, nine years ago, Just like honeybees need to have food stores for winter, I need to have heat stores for winter. And let's see, roughly 2007, we had an ice storm. Um, during that ice storm, we lost electricity for, I believe, seven days. And during that seven days, we heated, or during that period, I should say, not just during the seven days, um, we heated with propane. And we realized, not having electric, that the furnace blower does not work when you don't have power. It was at that point I knew we had to do something different um, as far as our heat. So we switched out our furnace and got wall mount heaters, ventless wall mount heaters, no fan required. And those worked out good until another ice storm came along a few years later. Didn't lose power for quite as long. Um, but when the power was out, we was able to heat the house. The problem is, is our propane tank went empty during that second ice storm. And the propane company was not able to get to us because we're out here in, in God's country. Um, some of these back roads aren't wide enough to pass another car. So the propane tank truck couldn't get out here to refill us. And that taught me another lesson. You know, propane might not be our, our choice. I need to find something different to heat our home with. And it was a few years later, um, I got the opportunity to start managing the farm up the road. Um, and I knew, you know, taking, um, going into a new occupation, that I would need to be able to live on, uh, less wages than what I was making before. Um, so what I did in the long run, let me cut the story short here, is we switched out and went to a wood burner. Got a real nice wood stove. I traded the neighbor um, an electric guitar and an amp for this wood stove. I can't remember the name or the brand right offhand. I'll put that down at the bottom of the screen here. Um, but the version we have is, I believe, the grandfather. I believe the grandmother um, stove is a little bit bigger than the grandfather stove. I could be wrong. But anyway, um, we got this wood stove and we've been heating with wood ever since and love it. That's our only source of heat. The downside to it is I'm getting older and cutting firewood plays a toll on my back. But uh, getting back to uh, taking a cut on my income, I knew I had to be able to do things to uh, survive, for my family to survive, but uh, still be able to make ends meet. And uh, one of those things I had to do on a cheaper budget was construct a woodshed. And, you know, the woodshed doesn't really look the greatest, but it serves its purpose. And it has for 
I'd say a good eight years. Anyhow, so what I want to do now is I would like to show you my woodshed that I constructed out of skids. So check this out. So here's our woodshed. It's made completely out of skids. And I realize it doesn't look the greatest with the tarp all cobbed up there at the front, but it serves a purpose. The tarp keeps the water from getting into the woodshed, keeps the wood dry. You can see what it looks like from the side here. I actually made walls out of the skids and then went up to the top, marked it with a chalk line to get my angle, and then took the chainsaw down through there. On the inside for trusses, I just used logs from our forest out back. And those have been there, well, this woodshed's been here eight years, believe it or not, and it's worked out quite well. Look at the other side here. This is what it looks like on this side. And the back is the same way, it's completely skids. So I made it wide enough here in the front right here that I could easily get my wood splitter in and out. Um, it's nice to be able to set the wood splitter right here, have your pile of logs over here to split. You split them, you chuck it in. Works out really, really well. But like I said, this year we decided to buy it. And uh, here's some pictures of what it looked like um, when we unloaded the firewood the other day. You can see it filled the whole doorway of the woodshed. Um, the next morning, first thing, it was like 7.30, me and Ladybug came out and we stacked it. So this is um, 12 feet long or wide and back there it's roughly seven feet tall. So that's what one cord got me and yeah, firewood did go up a little bit this year. Um, right now we're paying $200 per cord. So we paid $200 for all of that wood. Now for you people that don't burn wood that are kind of curious, um, right now if we were to have 26 to 30 degree temperatures every night I would guess this pile of wood would last us two months the problem is is it's going to get colder than that so we're going to need more on average we burn five cords a winter so we need to get four more and which we have uh, one more reserved I'm waiting to hear back on when he's going to deliver that but um, once he delivers that, we'll probably go ahead and reserve another, just because um, if we wait too long, the firewood will sell out and we'll be buying green wood, which green wood is wood that still has moisture in it. It was freshly cut. And I knew when he brought me this the other day, just by looking at it, like, look, take this piece of, of red oak. You can tell that this has some age to it just by looking at it. Um, a lot of people I find will say they've got seasoned firewood and then when you get it um, it looks like they just cut it and split it the day before so when I seen he actually had seasoned firewood I thought you know what we're gonna go ahead and reserve another one and that will give us two cord we will be setting pretty good for a little while now that doesn't mean since I'm buying this wood that I'm not gonna cut any firewood you see I have a log splitter over here and uh, works like a charm. Um, the only thing I do want to upgrade on the wood splitter is I'd like to get a heating pad and put down here on this base. This base is where your hydraulic fluid is. This is not just the axle, it's also the hydraulic fluid tank, at least over on that side. You can see the plug there at the top. Um, so I would like to put a heating pad on there so when it's super cold out, I can come in out here and plug it in for a little bit and it'll start a lot easier because that hydraulic fluid won't be quite so thick. I've actually got my chainsaw out here too. Um, but I have been cutting a little bit of wood here at the farm. What do you think, Ladybug? Ladybug? Honey, what do you got on your nose there, hon? I'll tell you what that is, just by the color. That's not mud, honey. That fine shade of green, that means you've been sniffing on the four-wheeler. And it wasn't this one because I didn't take it to the farm today. It was the little one. 
And that wasn't mud on your muzzle, honey. That was cow poop. You got some cow poop off of the four-wheeler. What you been nosing in the cow poop for, Ladybug? Huh? She says, Daddy, I like grass too. Cow poop's just, just broken down grass, Daddy. It's not really nasty. Oh yeah, you're gonna burp. I'm pretty sure that's what you had on your on your nose there, Ladybug. So anyway, folks, that's this week's video. Firewood bees. Um, now, in the next few days, I will be hitting all the hives again with an oxalic acid vapor treatment. Um, I won't be doing that first thing in the morning. I want the sun to be up. I want the cluster of bees to break up a little bit so that that vapor can get around each one of the bees and not just around the outside of the cluster treating everybody on the outside. I want to treat everybody. So hit them again, knock them mite levels down again, and uh, I'll feel a lot better going into winter. Now, if you have experience taking a nuke through winter in a single box, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts down below on what you did for supplementing. I've never ever fed fondant, but I'm seriously considering it. Um, so if you have any input on that, leave it down below. Much appreciated. Um, if you haven't subscribed, please do so. And if you enjoyed the video, thumbs up people. That'll help boost it in YouTube search ranks. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week. Come on, ladybugs.